Welcome to PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It's greatly appreciated. In this video, we're going to discuss myths associated with spirometer calibration and verification. Firstly, most technologists refer solely to calibration, but calibration is not what you are doing with your 3 liter syringe first thing in the morning. In most cases, you are actually performing verification. Calibration and verification are very different things, and it's important to recognize the difference. Calibration is comparing the performance of a spirometer to a standard measurement, in this case 3 liters, then adjusting the instrument to match that standard. Cal or span factors show how much the spirometer reading had to be adjusted to meet the 3 liter target. Ideally, these factors would be close to 1. There are limits on how much the device should be adjusted to meet the 3 liter target. For example, the 2019 ATS ERA spirometry standard states that manufacturers must provide an alert if new calibration factor varies more than two standard deviations from the mean calibration factor or changes by more than 6% from the previous calibration factor. Calibration verification is what most people are doing first thing in the morning. Cal verification is verifying that the calibration of the spirometer is acceptable. So I like to teach it like this. When you're calibrating the spirometer, you're teaching the software that this is 3 liters, this is 3 liters with each stroke of the syringe. But when you're performing verification, you're asking the question, is this 3 liters, is this 3 liters? This is an example of calibration verification. So this is what you'd be doing first thing in the morning when you're setting up your machines. As you can see here on the right panel, these are the targets for both inspiratory and expiratory strokes at low, medium, and high speeds. And these strokes are on the outside of that range. In fact, some of them are not in the range. If you look in the left panel with the flow volume loop, each row that turns green indicates that the cal verification is within the target range. And only the inspiratory at high flow passed. So this failed calibration verification. When a calibration uh, verification fails, firstly, you want to look and see if there's any correctable problems. If you're using a metal screen type of new attack, maybe, there, maybe there's some debris on the screen, something like that. Maybe you need to change the pitot tube if you're using that kind of a device. So once you've done that, you want to recalibrate. And as I said, this is teaching the software that this stroke is three liters, and that was was done here. And as you can see, both for inspired and expired, all of the readings now read around three liters. And so that's the difference between verifying calibration and actually calibrating it. Calibrating it is adjusting the machine so it'll read the desired target. According to the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society standards, an acceptable calibration verification with a three liter syringe should read three liters plus or minus three percent. There's a two 0.5% error for the spirometer and a half a percent error for the syringe. So when you do these cal verifications, they should read between 2.91 and 3.09 liters. I believe it is a myth, however, that if you do cal verification and your recorded values fall within the plus or minus 3% range, that that means that there is nothing wrong with your spirometer, everything is working fine. This is a case that we had published in European Respiratory Journal Open Research asking the question, should spirometer quality control be treated like other laboratory devices? So this was one morning in my laboratory and I was doing cal verification and I got a reading of 3.07 liters. So that is within the standard 2.91 to 3.09 range that's recommended by the ATS ERS standards. However, this was a quite unusual finding for this particular device. So I compared this reading of 3.07 to the historical performance of this spirometer, specifically looking at plus or minus two standard deviations and three standard deviations. You can see the ATS ERS standards are here and here. And this reading, even though it was within the ATS ERS standards, was almost six standard deviations outside of this historical control and this was out of control and we had to recalibrate the machine. So I think it's important uh, not to fall into a, a false sense of security that 
I'm within the plus or minus 3% range. If things are trending up or trending down or uh, close to those limits, you may need to recalibrate your device. Another calibration myth that's often associated with handheld or office barometers is that you don't need to calibrate these. Uh, these come with pre-calibrated pneumatac tubes, for example. And that is true um, that you don't need to calibrate them because they're pre-calibrated, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to verify that the calibration is accurate. So don't be fooled. When a manufacturer advertises their product and says, you don't need to calibrate this spirometer, what this really means is you can't calibrate the spirometer. However, you still need to verify that the calibrations are accurate. So where do myths in pulmonary diagnostics originate? I've mentioned a couple times the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society technical statements. But unfortunately, sometimes these myths come from these documents themselves. For example, in the 2019 spirometry standard, I found this statement a bit of a stretch. If an inline filter is used in spirometry testing, then it must also be used during calibration and verification. So we studied this idea and had it published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. We compared filter versus no filter at low, medium, and fast speeds. We used four pressure differential pneumatacs. That was two metal screens, one Fleisch pneumatac, one with a pitot tube. We used one heated wire pneumatac and one dry rolling seal spirometer. The largest difference we saw between calibrating with a filter in place and no filter was 20 mLs, 0.7%. That was the largest difference. Most of the time we saw no difference at all. There was another statement in the 2019 spirometry standard that I found to be a bit of a stretch. And that was, holding the syringe during calibration can raise its temperature and contribute to measurement error. So we tested this idea in the same study that I referenced. Our first experiment, we took the calibration syringe and I held it uh, in a bear hug for a full minute then we repeated cal verification at low, mid, and high flows. At low flows, there was a 20 mL difference. There was no difference at mid flows. And at high flows, there was a small 10 mL difference. We didn't stop there. The next experiment we did was we put the calibration syringe in a heater for 10 minutes at 96 degrees and then repeated the calibration verification. At low flows, there was a 30 mL difference, only 1%. Mid flow, there was no difference, and high flows, a 10 mL difference, which was 0.3% difference. So there is no reason why you cannot hold a syringe. There's even companies now that are making devices that will hold a syringe, so you don't have to touch it. I think that's absurd. What we've shown is that holding the syringe does not change the temperature, and it certainly doesn't change the calibration values. Another myth and trap that a lot of people fall into is the idea that cal verification is something you only do in the morning. You come in first thing, you turn your machines on, you do your cal verifications, put the syringe away, and just go to patient testing. But it's important to repeat cal verification whenever you suspect there might be a problem when something doesn't just look right. Let me give you a couple examples. Whenever you change a pneumatac element, in this case a pitot tube, it's always important to make sure that you repeat the cal verification. As you can see in this example, that the expiratory strokes are all way out of the expected range for cal verification. So if I didn't verify the calibration when I changed the pitot tube, all of the expiratory values would be inaccurate. I'm also very suspicious when I see extraordinary bronchodilator response and when I see very high peak flows, as you can see here, it goes off the screen. So in this case, there was an enormous response to bronchodilator, or so it seemed, but I wanted to verify that everything was accurate. And I'm happy that I repeated the calibration verification because it failed. And when I investigated the problem, this is a pressure differential pneumatac that used a metal screen, I found that there had been moisture building up on the screen, making everything falsely high. So I removed all this excess moisture from the screen and repeated the calibration. 
After I corrected the problem, I repeated the post bronchodilator spirometry, and you can see that there was still a pretty significant bronchodilator response, but certainly nothing like it was when the pneumotac was uh, filled with fluid. There was a 1,070 ml error in the FVC and a 900 ml uh, error in the FEV1. So it's always a good idea, whenever something doesn't look quite right, I'll pull out the calibration syringe and redo the verification just so I make sure that everything is accurate and the patient doesn't get misdiagnosed. Key points, it's important to understand the difference between calibration and verification. Calibration verification readings within the plus or minus 3% range doesn't ensure that the spirometer is functioning normally. I think a plus or minus 3 standard deviation range is better. Don't be fooled by products that say no need to calibrate. You still need to verify that the calibration is correct. Filters do not affect the calibration and verification. You can hold the syringe during calibration and verification. I think that the idea that you can't hold the syringe when you're doing calibration and verification is absurd. And don't hesitate to repeat calibration and verification. Whenever ever something looks not quite right, it only takes about a minute or so to, to do a cal verification. and It'll ensure that the testing data that you're submitting is accurate and the patient gets the correct treatment and diagnosis. Thank you for watching PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons, and we'll see you next time.